There is nothing noble in being a potard, in being suboptimal or stupid. People in general respond to competence, both men, but especially women. That is why I devised a simple switch that you can flick that would help on your procrastination days where you feel you know, particularly apathetic and lethargic. One that addresses your lack of creativity, your lack of focus, and also your perceived confidence and competence to others in the environment. Here's the perennial pickle I face when diving into videos that promise to do what my title does. Terms like creativity, focus, IQ often feel like they're kind of floating in a haze, leaving me unsure about which specific metric or variable will begin to change over time. Take creativity, for example. Does it mean I'll suddenly excel as a oil painter, at cross hatching, at watercolors? You might count it, well, no, Joseph, it means you have more frequent and higher quality ideas, which sure has some merit, but in still some ways, it's very nebulous comparatively to something more concrete like increase in muscle power. You can quantify that quite objectively. I like to call the following features of a brain that is working above average or what you might experience in your consciousness after you integrate this system. So first, let's discuss what we mean. Let's get specific by the term cognition. One of the most fascinating aspects is enhanced cognitive load or RAM. So this gauges the mental effort needed for a task. I noticed that my ability to handle information during a specific task or period improved. Take something like editing, for example. It, it demands a large amount of RAM as you're juggling various pieces of information to create something coherent. A prime way people absolutely obliterate their cognitive RAM is by multitasking with unrelated activities. That's the key point, like watching TV whilst writing. The habit significantly weakens the skill over time. Another interesting variable is cognitive accuracy and speed, which is fairly straightforward in a metric which quantifies how precise and fast an individual is in their performance on such cognitive tasks. Now, this is a skill I often struggled with at school, particularly during exams. Often I would read the question once and then begin to devise what I thought was the answer to the question. But in fact, many times what we do is we see what we want predicated on the knowledge that we already have. So we're biased in that way which is to say I was answering the question I wanted to answer based on the limited information that I could fundamentally remember, which compromised the accuracy of the task I was doing. This is actually a very, very difficult skill because it requires you to have good working memory on both a macro and micro level, which is to say the overall goal of the task plus working memory on a micro level, such as the smaller components, while maintaining relevancy to the overall task. Then we consider the metric of speed, which is simply the length to the task being completed. Uh, cognitive recall is another really interesting concept, which hopefully doesn't need too much delineation. Simply the ability to remember information for a uh, with a consideration for the speed, you are equally doing that at. Uh, one of the interesting metrics in which I personally uh, measure this is social interaction and my fluency. If I find myself kind of grasping for the next thought, word, idea, concept, to bring to verbal realization, then my skill is impaired. Writing equally I can find could be a phenomenon that can be measured in which I'm you know, writing a uh, book, for instance, and I'm looking for the next word to say and drawing a blank, as it were. And then there is creativity, a little bit difficult to discern. Um, I will go back to the earlier points that I made in terms of fluency, so the number of ideas generated in a given time. I'd also attribute flexibility, so the variety or diversity of the ideas you can produce at that time. And I would also go with originality, the uniqueness or novelty of the idea, which fundamentally actually is an amalgamation with various different ideas that you bring together in order to create something a little bit more uh, unique and different and novel in that way. Uh, I would also merit elaboration, so the level of detail or development in the particular idea from its inception. And then we have to talk about focus, another really curious and well sought after skill for many individuals. Everybody knows that the life they want is always on the other side of taming their ability to focus with large portions of attention that select period of time and, and, and consciously like bring that to the forefront of your consciousness whenever you need it to be. Now, one of the ways that I quantify this skill is 
is the strength of our prefrontal cortex or density of neural connections in the gray matter comparatively to our limbic system response. Now, um, in a more maybe scientific parlance, you might understand this as top-down control versus bottom-up. Um, uh, even more colloquially, let, let's say, um, uh, intention versus reaction. This is, again, a very challenging metric to control because factors such as, you know, uh, factors influencing attention, pardon me, are enormously more complex. You can take into account psychological states, visual characteristics, the difficulty of the task. But for our purposes, we'll kind of narrow this down into factors that we can influence. Then if you're interested, I can do another deep dive on deep focus. So the former point we will address, alertness and sustained attention. Visual spatial orientation, selective executive functions such as divided attention, inhibitory uh, control, and also uh, flexibility equally. So I've done my due diligence. I've been spending the last two weeks kind of sourcing various different scientific papers, anecdotes, and a sprinkling of my own personal experience here on what is the most important outcomes in which you know my systems will promote. Now the the phenomenon that we really want to kind of promote in relation to the systems that we are integrating is nerve growth factor. So my argument is predicated on the fact that much of what you might call features of intelligence, such as focus, creativity, are simply dependent on the health of our communication systems within our body, more particularly our brain, more particularly our neurons. If our neuron health is, is poor, if it has dissolved, then equally we're going to see a impact on all the other features that we have we have previously mentioned. So the promotion of nerve growth factor effects may uh, in, in, in influence many different processes, but we need only know five, as which you will learn, have a direct experience on our perceived uh, confidence and confidence. So number one is going to be the cognitive enhancement element. So NGF promotes the survival and growth of neurons, particularly in the basal forebrain system, which is crucial for cognitive functions like attention, memory, and learning. We also have to merit neuroplasticity. So NGF stimulates neuroplasticity, allowing the brain to kind of form new neural connections and adapt to new information or experiences. This is really, really important if you don't want to stay the same person, if you kind of want to build upon the individual you are in your identity. So this enhanced neuroplasticity could potentially support creative thinking and problem solving abilities. We will also talk about neuroprotection. So it's not enough to build upon the neurons that we, we want to increase, but also keep the ones that we have. So NGF equally has these properties that can help preserve and maintain healthy nerve cells, which is essentially important for cognitive function and mental clarity. We should also talk about neurotransmitter regulation. So um, the chemical signature, signatures between the, the electrons. So electric into chemical, chemical back into electric. So NGF equally synthesizes and influences the release of the synthesis of neurotransmitters such as acetylcholine, which is involved in attention, memory, and cognitive processes. Nerve uh, cell recovery, so repairing the damaged, injured nerves due to a number of degenerative uh, lifestyle practices, which I'm sure will bleed into the discussions here. And uh, neurogenerative, uh, neurodegenerative, pardon me, conditions such as Alzheimer's, dementia, uh, it's remarkable how early onset some of these things can happen, early as, you know, 40s and 50s. So one of the most fascinating, potent, ubiquitous substances yet underrealized, in my personal opinion, and our first system is going to be fungi. There are more species of fungi on this planet than plants, so there's a lot of variety. I'm currently consulting the literature relative to people's aims. More specifically for our purposes, one variation of fungi I believe belongs in our system has the following effects on our neurochemistry and biology. So the first point is going to be improved blood flow to the brain, ensuring that neurons receive adequate oxygen and nutrients for which is important for optimal cognitive recovery and promotion of some of the aforementioned um, NGF properties. Reduce of symptoms like anxiety and depression, which can indirectly improve cognitive performance, a better move can obviously enhance focus, attention and uh, problem solving. Um, you, you don't function well when you're depressed, when you've just had a breakup, when you're ill, just just doesn't work, simply put. We also want to talk about reduction in amyloid plaques, which are proteins that can promote some of the aforementioned neurodegenerative conditions like Alzheimer's disease, um, 
upregulation of the levels of transmitters, acetylcholine, equally we talked about, improved myelin sheath protection, which is kind of the insulation of the fibers that, that kind of facilitate efficient transmission from electrical sign uh, signals in the uh, nervous system, which can include cognitive functions, enhancing speed, efficiency of neurocommunication, very, very important in that respect. Of course, synaptic pl uh, plasticity, which is the ability of the synapses to strengthen or weaken over time. Enhancing this plasticity is associated with improved learning, uh, memory recall, and overall cognitive uh, function. There's other smaller elements, stimulation of BGF, neuroprotective and reduction in inflammation is always going to be congruent to, uh, to, to these outcomes. So what am I talking about? Of course, I'm talking about the shaggy eccentric wizard fungi known as lion's mane with its cascading icicle like appearance, which resembles that of a wild, uh, lion. If that lion had a penchant for joining a avant-garde art collection. Revered in ancient Chinese and Japanese medicine, lion's mane is hailed for its potential impacts on cognitive function, boosting creativity and fending off the brain fog that plagues us mere mortals. It's like a little personal trainer for your neurons, pushing them to lift heavier thoughts and run faster synaptically. Now let's discuss the fabled deep work phenomenon, these transcendent states where you have you know, um, you, you might have touched whereby you were driving down this kind of rainbow road of cognitive output without drifting off course. And, you know, my estimation is one of the most rewarding states, even more re rewarding to kind of look back retrospectively and gone, goodness gracious me, I was four hours deep and I was laser focused. Like your mind and body become united in a meditative state and tools like your keyboard become an extension of your very nervous system. It's, it's really, really uh, amazing. Or like sports players, like a tennis racket is an extension of your arm. Reaching the summit of such performance in my estimation comes out of consequence of your input, more specifically uh, food type and also the eating window in which you select your food. Now, while not directly mentioned in the search results, ketones produced during ketosis have been shown to, you know, in some studies increase uh, BDNF. So this is brain derived neurotropic factor, which is related to NGF. Anecdotally, myself, I would report improvements in my memory, my focus, my overall um, RAM in tasks and cognitive performance, improvements in my mood and uh, mood not rude, and reductions in anxiety and depressive uh, symptoms. In a more scientific vernacular, stabilizing blood sugar levels and eliminating carbohydrates, uh, carbohydrates reduces fog, brain fog, and, uh, and it enhances overall cognitive output. Uh, on a more personal note, I do find when I limit my food uh, selection to proteins and fats, then this is more prominent. Classical mistakes, not eating enough fat, you know, ketones are derived from the fat. Uh, high fat ground beef is my favorite and it's also very, very cheap. Offal wouldn't go amiss either, oxtail, liver, bone marrow, equally a lot, equally a lot of, uh, you know, butter, eggs and bacon will be very, very resourceful. Now I will mention I don't eat exclusively like this for 365 days a year. So I kind of do this. I, I notice this when I'm cycling on and off carbs. Carbs are very important but it depends on the utility. You know, what are you eating them for? Don't mindlessly eat, you know, pasta, rice, potatoes, if there's no point to that. What improves my ability to get back into ketosis dramatically though, is when I pair this with some form of fasting. Now, there are several points to be, make, uh, to be made here. The number one is enhanced mental clarity. So fasting leads to clearer levels of thinking, improved cognitive function by reducing toxic materials in the blood and the lymphatic system. Equally, you need to recognize that all that energy going into digestion and peristalsis becomes available for your cognition, uh, which a lot of people don't actually consider. Yes, it takes energy to actually digest your food. So if you're not digesting food, then you free up resources to be used elsewhere. We also talk about increased BDNF production. So fasting triggers the production of brain-derived neurotropic factor, a protein which is essential for uh, all brain health. And it's also associated with uh, you know, cognitive performance, learning, memory, and the rest. Neuroplasticity, enhancing its ability to adapt to different um, stresses, injuries, and disease on the, on, in, in the brain. Uh, autophagy equally activates a cellular cleaning or I like to call it a recycling process of all the damaged proteins and cells and plaque and pus and the debris that is in your body that you just haven't had the time to kind of clean out. It's, it's, it's spring cleaning. That's what autophagy is. And then you can promote 
new cells, new neuro uh, neural connections, pardon me. But so there's, there's really a lot here uh, based on what we've talked about so far, reducing inflammation, metabolic switching from glucose to ketones is or, or has shown scientifically to be um, to be better for us to, 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 to function cognitively. Now, regarding creativity, a whole host of other interesting psychological phenomenon, including a loss of sense of self, which I mean in the sense that depending on how you use this, you can destroy parts of the self and actually build upon it. Now for the, the, the next part, it is educational. It's not in any way to kind of encourage you to do this. Knowledge is kind of power in this regard. You know, it's really interesting, those kind of YouTube titles on how to destroy yourself and recreate a new identity. I'm a sucker for those kind of things. Maybe not so much now, maybe a couple of years ago. But the interesting point for me is the continuity in all of them to offer what I like to call is um, a clean slate protocol. They, 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 they have nothing that is more effective in my estimation than getting the result that you want from the titles comparatively to what I have for you in this next part. So the utility of micro and macro dosing psilocybin is proving both scientifically and anecdotally to be holistically one of the most powerful consciousness expanding substances that grow naturally on this earth. Now, as, as much as I'm going to focus on the outcome of the creativity aspect in this video, it's always really difficult to restrain myself because I've read the literature, I've read the anecdotes, and it's, it's, it's really exciting. You know, um, utility in quitting alcohol, weed, cocaine, uh, co cocaine, cocaine, maybe cocaine, I don't know, and other substances have been noted. Merit in treatment for anxiety, depression, PTSD, and other neurotic tendencies. You know, more specifically, psilocybin has been shown to increase connectivity in different regions of the brain, which can kind of break these rigid patterns of thinking and promote more flexibility, more creative thought processes. Look, like here's, here's a really interesting kind of trite saying and cliche saying that you might have heard before that most people's identities remain the same once they reach 30. So you become this kind of very, you, you become very inflexible and uh, psilocybin, it, it it breaks this mold, making you more flexible, more open, more creative. I, I'm sure you know these people. Uh, divergent thinking, for example. So microdosing psilocybin has been associated with enhanced divergent thinking, which is the ability to generate uh, uh, creative ideas by exploring these possible solutions, which can improve problem solving and, and you know, overall creative output. It's also been shown to boost levels of BDNF, the brain's fertilizer that helps existing neurons thrive and spur the growth of new neurons and synapses, which can jazz up cognitive functions like memory and, uh, and learning. Uh, as for nerve growth factor, which is the impetus for most of the points that I'm trying to make here, the research on psilocybin directly impacts, a little bit sparse, However, given the general uptick in neurotrophic and uh, neurotroptic factors, pardon me, like BDNF, it's reasonable to assume positive effects on NGF as uh, well. Now, as for the options in regards to application, I distinguish between two in the preface. The first is macro dosing. Now, this is something that I've been doing for many, many years. It's something that I do only every 12 to 24 months. It's also known as your heroic dose of psilocybin. And uh, it's kind of like pushing, like if, if a human being had a reset button, it would be heroic doses of uh, psilocybin. I've used various different sources in my estimation. I've used truffles, I've used magic mushrooms, uh, all in legal parts of the world, uh, pardon me. And um, it's amazing, it's transcendental. Well, words fail to, words are not a useful tool that allows you to explain what you are experiencing when you are having that kind of experience to be completely transparent with you but one of the things you come out with the only thing that i believe is comparable is really to to kind of trite and cliche faux pas sayings and platitudes about life like one of the recent ones was life is all about moving forward now, now, I know that sounds very, very simple, very, very trite, very, very easy to kind of say, quotable, you can throw it away. But I came out of, a, and, and these things last a long time as well, nine to 12 hours of intense spiritual trip. And I came out of it going, as long as you're moving forward, right? Every single day, you're doing something to move forward, you'll be fine. God will take care of you. And, and, and maybe something to quantify this a little bit more, but better is if you go 50% of the way always, 
God will meet you 50% of the way. You have to put in effort every single day. As long as you do that, God will catch you. It's kind of like a leap of faith. And that insight has followed me for the last 24 months. And it, it, it kind of accrues in power as, 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 uh, as it goes along for about, I would say, 24 months. And then it starts to diminish. And that's when you might need another uh, a macro dose. What I have less experience with, but well, at this time I have less experience with, is microdosing, which involves taking a 10th or a 20th, depending on your sensitivity to psilocybin, every single day. Essentially, the concept is to reap the cognitive enhancement benefits without being over encumbered by the hallucinatory elements of uh, psilocin. One of the big draws for me is the relationship it has with the uh, serotonin uh, receptors. And this has been marked up in the data as well, that people just seem to be a lot happier, a lot more content to mitigate depression, anxiety on psilocybin. So the active metabolite, uh, psilocin, which I mentioned before, exerts its effects by activating serotonin 2A receptors in the brain, which are the same receptors serotonin binds to. So the activation is believed to be the key behind psilocybin, uh, psilocybin's pardon me, psychedelic and mood enhancing and altering effects. They've actually found that um, the mood enhancing effects can persist, persist beyond the acute drug experience. So one week after psilocybin administration, researchers observed that reduced negative effects and increased uh, positive effects. So it begins to, again, it, it's not like one day or two days you feel, you know, very, very high and, and then you go back to normal. No, it begins to kind of accrue in strength. So you get these massive long-term benefits, especially if you're microdosing every single day. So even one month post-administration positive effects remained elevated and trait anxiety was reduced. It's also been shown to increase synaptic density, particularly in the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. So, you know, your brain is communicating with every single aspect of each different division of the gray matter. And, you know, the increased neuroplasticity uh, can attribute to mood developments, um, you know, long term, as I mentioned before. It also affects brain connectivity, particularly in regions involving uh, emotional processing. It reduces threat-induced modulation of the amyg amygdala connectivity, which may contribute to, you know, kind of, you know, fear states, fear response. So more contentment in those, uh, in those moments. And increased resting states, uh, functional connections across the brain were observed uh, up to one month post psilocybin. So again, I'm no... I'm, I'm, I'm not encouraging you to do this, but um, I will be very surprised in the next 50 years if we don't recognize that this is something that um, has enormous quality of life benefits. It almost sounds like a super pill. Like it reminds me of NZ. What's the one in Limitless? I can't remember. Maybe you can put it in the comment sections below. But these are not theories today. These are facts, gentlemen. Speak soon.